David Cullen Bain, the Dunedin man found guilty of murdering his family, appeared to go into a state of shock on hearing the guilty verdict. He started saying black hands, that they were taking them away. Black hands. Do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> I want to assure you, I did not kill my family. It must have been a terrible week, that first week after the shootings. The wider Bain family were left shocked and appalled, and police faced a huge task to gather evidence and investigate leads. Relatives spent that first week helping to organise the funerals and looking after David. He gave instructions that his parents should be cremated and his siblings buried. He told them his family thought a funeral should be a celebration. No one felt like celebrating. I'm journalist Martin Van Bainen. This is the fourth episode of a podcast series on the Bain family murders in Dunedin on June the 20th, 1994. The series looks again at who was truly responsible. There were only two candidates. David Bain or his father, Robin. We have already covered the murder scene, the Bain family, and the lead up to the shootings. And in this episode, we look at the weeks following the murders, as relatives tried to come to terms with the shootings, and police grew dubious about David's story. The defence camp says David should be seen in these weeks as a shocked and traumatised young man whose behaviour cannot be judged by normal standards. The Crown, on the other hand, says David's unusual actions should be seen as those of a person trying to hide his crime and possibly racked with guilt. David was removed from the house at 65 Every Street about 10.30 on the morning of the shootings. He was taken to the CIB office, examined by the police doctor and interviewed for about three hours. The interviewer, Detective Sergeant Greg Dunn, remembered David being very deliberate as Dunn's remarks read by an actor show. He spoke with his eyes averted down as if he was recounting in his mind a scene. He spoke freely and was calm throughout. The only time he displayed any emotion was when I confirmed to him that his mother and father were dead. At that stage, tears rolled down his eyes and he covered his nose and face area with his hands. He didn't ask about his brother or two sisters. Essentially, David's story was that he had come home, put on some washing and then found first his mother, and then his father, dead. It wasn't hard to spot some obvious problems with David's account. The first was that he had told the emergency call taker they were all dead. But there he was telling police he had seen only Margaret and Robin. And what about the missing 25 minutes? David was home from his paper run by about quarter to seven, So why the gap before he called the emergency services about nine minutes past seven? It raised the awkward question of what he did during that time. Other disturbing questions also presented themselves. For instance, why had David gone from his mother's room to the lounge where Robin was found? After all, no one slept in the lounge. It wasn't a bedroom. And how did David know his mother was dead, rather than just unconscious? This is from his police interview on the day after the shootings, now voiced by actors. He had already been interviewed for about three hours the day before. How did you know Mum wasn't alive? The pallor was obvious enough. No one is that white and the blood on her face. She didn't respond and with her eyes open. Why did you leave the room? I was scared. I was confused. I wasn't scared only for myself, but for others. I needed to find out what was going on. I ran from her room calling for my father and ran straight to the lounge. I was thinking about that last night after you asked why I did that. I might have done that because his influence was concentrated there more than anywhere in the house. His computer, his instruments on the wall. I opened the door and the light from my room shone in. The curtains were pulled closed. I saw him lying on the floor. I went in a few steps and saw the blood on his face. I ran out to the phone and called the police. Did you touch the rifle? No. 
After checking your mum and wanting to know how everyone else was, why didn't you check on Stephen? I don't know. I was calling my dad because a feeling of security, wanting someone who can deal with the situation. Are you positive you never went into any of the other rooms? Yes. How do you explain that 25 minutes in the house before you called the ambulance? I don't know. Slow? Recently I've been spacing out. It has happened in the last couple of months. Last time it happened was the Symphonia. I don't remember two movements. The people I was with said I was watching the show. Before that, all I can think of is when time flew. Went by very quickly. I, I can't tell when it starts or ends. Without harping on, Dave, can you think of any reason why you said that your whole family had been killed to the 111 lady when you had only seen or knew about mum and dad? I don't know. We'll come back to the spacing out in another episode, but at this stage, we need to note that David's story was to change dramatically later. After the shootings, David went to stay with Margaret's younger sister, Jan, and her husband, Bob. Jan wanted to try to understand what had happened. She went into this in detail at David's second trial in 2009. Yes, I said that I realised that there had been difficulties between Margaret and Robin, but I had thought that things had in fact been improving, so I asked him if there was anything that had happened over the course of the weekend that could have caused such a terrible tra- tragedy. David said to me, no, that um, nothing extraordinary had happened, that it was much the same as usual, that it was um, always a little tense at weekends when Dad was home. And that particular conversation, did that occur again subsequent to that? Yes, it did. Yes, on the Tuesday morning when again we were talking, he repeated that to me. Did you talk about Lani Ed on this particular morning? It was back to the the 20th. Yes. I asked David, I was surprised that Lani Ed was at home because I knew at that time that she was uh, living out at Robin's house in Tari Beach and... I said to him that um, why was Lani at home? I was surprised that Lani was at home. And he said that he had, um, in fact, gone to uh, the museum cafe and um, talked to him to come home. Did you ask him about the Monday morning, what had happened as far as he was concerned? Yes, I asked him if anything untoward had happened that morning, anything extraordinary, and he said, well, he had left on his paper run earlier than usual, um, and he had run all the way. When he got back, he said he had found his mother and father dead. On the Tuesday morning, while David was still in bed, they talked about the funeral arrangements. He wanted to be fully in charge. Well, first of all, he said that he would like the service to be held at the Anderson's Bay Presbyterian Church, and he would like David Carmichael, who was a family friend, to actually take that service. And he wanted the Quakers to be involved in the actual service in some way. Uh, he said that um, he wanted uh, the service to uh, have a lot of music, he wanted uh, music to be very much a part of that, and he said you know, he wanted the um, Forest Requiem to be played for Margaret, and Bach's ear on a G-string for Arawa, and the Queen's song, Who Wants to Live Forever, for Laniette. He said he would like a trumpet piece, probably, for Stephen. He hadn't decided at that point what um, he would want exactly there. And he wanted the Royal Mail Choir to um, sing, and whatever they chose to sing, he said, would be for Robin. He then said he would like to sing at the funeral himself. And I said to him, oh, look, dear, I don't think you realise just what you're expecting of yourself. It's a very hard thing to do. On the Tuesday evening, David asked to see the days of Tiger Daily Times to catch up with what had been written about the shootings. The police had told the clerks they should try to keep David away from reports of the killings but David would not be dissuaded. David sat for some time reading it 
uh, he started to show signs of distress um, reading that and I saw tears in his eyes and at that point Bob took him up to our bedroom because um, there were a lot of other people around and so on just so that he could have some privacy. A short while later I went up to check and see how David was and when I came into the bedroom he was sitting on our bed and he had his head and his hands and his um, arms down on his knees bending forward and I went over to him straight away and said, oh, you know, sweetheart, we didn't, this is why we didn't want you to read the paper. And um, he said, they lied to me. He said, they, they weren't asleep. He said, they knew they were going to die. He had to look them in the eye and shoot them. No. Apart from the, the way he was sitting, you've just, you've just described, <coughs> did you notice anything else about him at that stage? At that point, he, was, he spoke quite um, in his, what I would call, normal voice. He's speaking as he would normally have done so. But at that point, his, um, everything really changed. He... Um, his whole body language changed, his hands, he clenched his hands tight, his eyes were squeezed tight, they closed, he, um, his whole body seemed to be tense and um, he started to uh, speak in a really slow, deliberate uh, way. The words were almost as though they were being dragged out of him. Um, his, there was a lot of saliva in his speech, and as he um, as he spoke, I could feel spit, you know, spray from his um, speaking on my actual face. And he he started saying black hands, and that they were taking them away. Black hands. He couldn't stop <coughs> them, and are taking him away, them away. And he's repeated this over and over. Then he said um, he should have run faster. And I said to David, no, David, you know, it's not your fault. You know, and um, you couldn't have done anything, you know. And then he continued saying black hands and then dying, everyone dying and black hands. It was all quite jumbled. He was going from one thing to another, taking them away. I can't stop them. And this went on for quite a long period. And I said to him, David, are they trying to take you away too? And he said, no, just the family. And then he said, it's just like Schindler's List. He said, like Schindler's List. And then he went back to saying black hands and taking them away, dying, dying, everyone dying, death, dying, dying all around, dying everywhere. Um, <sighs> and... Um, Ask him anything at this stage? Yes, I said, David, did you see them dying? And David stopped what he was saying. He said, No. He said, I only saw Mum and Dad, and they were already dead. And his speech returned to normal. It's interesting to look at the Otago Daily Times on that Tuesday to see what stimulated this odd reaction from David. The articles in the paper contain only one reference to the bodies. Here it is. All the victims had been shot in the head. Some were found in their beds, others beside their beds. David knew where his parents were found, but it's worth noting the newspaper does not say which siblings were found beside their beds. Margaret's other sister Val Boyd and her husband John arrived at the Clark house on Tuesday after driving down from Wellington. David, Val said, was very specific about how the funerals should be run and wouldn't brook any opposition. She told the court in David's second trial... Yes, there were lots of plans. He'd made decisions on, 
on music for everybody. There was to be a person to uh, um, do a tribute for each person um, and, uh, and music for each person. Um, and he, he knew exactly who was it to be and the music that it was to be and the flowers to go on the coffins and it was all, all done. And the clothing, yes, somebody was going to, have, the police were going to have to go to the house to get the clothing. He had, um, he had a list of things that, um, what they were to wear, the jewellery, um, the, uh, he wanted Ara to wear a particular gown and a super bra. As far as the discussions, it's clear that sometimes you or another person other than David would make some intervention or suggestion. What reaction did that get from David or his sons? If it wasn't what he wanted, um, he switched off. It, it, um, if, it, you know, if you uh, like to do with the, um, the church, if it wasn't going to be his um, choice, then he wasn't interested. Val Boyd also told David's second trial about a long conversation she had with him late on the Wednesday night, that is two days after the shootings. Yes, um, he talked about the family situation and so on. He talked about his father. He talked about that he hated his father. He said he was um, sneaky. He used to listen into conversations that he um, that had nothing to do with him. Um, did you say why he, apart from that, any other reason why he hated his father? Give me concrete instances. Or? No, well, he said that um, he he wasn't accepting that that um, they didn't want him there, uh, but it was his family, and it was his house, and he was staying. Up until this time, from what you've seen of the family and, and talking to them over the years, I'm talking about, had you gained any idea of? Um, this attitude of David towards his father? No, I'd, I'd, never, I'd never experienced it before. It's clear then that David had, despite being traumatised, planned out the family's funeral in great detail. His aunts and a victim support counsellor were struck by how little emotion he showed during the week and were shocked when he wanted to have a party at the clerk's house for Arawa, whose birthday fell on the Sunday after the shootings. After David's Black Hands incident, his girlfriend came for a visit and she told David's second trial. I didn't want to sort of ask him too much, but I, we, we did talk a bit. And um, he was very uh, upset that Arrow was out of bed and that Stephen had had to fight. Now, when he said he was upset about that, did he say whether he'd seen Arrow out of bed or he'd been learning that from someone? No, he had learnt that. He, I, he, I said to him, did you see your father? And he said yes, but he, he didn't, he hadn't seen the, the, cho- the children. Um, <clears throat> so, you may have been still before, from whom had he learnt that Arrow and Stephen had been out of bed rather than killed in their sleep? He learned that from reading the newspaper. And who had told him that they had been had died in their sleep? He said. He said the police had. I don't know which officer. All right. I. Well, he's. He was angry with Greg Dunn. He said that he was angry. I. I don't know whether it was he that told him. Yeah. Did you say anything more about the events that morning when he returned home? Um, yes, he said that the police had told him that there were no third parties, so it was either him or his father. And he said to me, if it's my father, I can never forgive him. And he started, and he, then he said, and if it was me, and I interrupted him, and I said, David, you could never do that. Um, did you say anything about... The gun that had been used, or the weapon? Yeah, he said that it was his gun. Um, 
I was absolutely terrified that he might be accused of doing this. And I asked him if he had blood on him, and he said no. And I said, thank God for that. Did he talk about any other things apart from the events on the morning when he came home? Um, I asked him how the weekend was, and he said that it was like any other normal weekend. But he said that when he got home on the Friday, he felt tension in the house. He and his father had an argument about the chainsaw. His father wanted to take, take his father wanted to take it back to the school in the week, and he wanted it in the on the property. Did he indicate whether the police might want to speak to you? He did. Um, he uh, he said he said to me that there was a period of time from the Monday morning that he couldn't account for. Um, he said that he was home for about 25 minutes from when uh, the when he came in the house to when he rang the police and he said he could only account for about five minutes of that time and he said um, that he the, the 20 minutes could be something could have similar could have happened to what had happened at the Symphonia concert when he'd Sort of zoned out, and that that um, it might be a form of epilepsy or something that m meant that he had this period of memory loss. Did he make any comment about Stephen? Um, yes, he said uh, he he was very upset that Stephen had to fight, and he almost was choking when he was saying Stephen had to fight. And he was so much stronger than me. Did you make any comment about Laniette? I, because I knew that Laniette was flatting, <coughs> I was quite surprised that she was in the house at all. And I, I just said to him, why did Laniette stay? And he said that um, she was going to be going to work the following morning and had asked to stay the night. He was going to take her to work the next day. Um, <coughs> the, did you talk about anything about himself or about his condition? Um, when we were talking about the 20 minutes that he couldn't account for, he said that he had some injuries that he didn't know how he had got and he had a bump on his head that he pointed out to me. On the Wednesday night, David's girlfriend, who we have called Harriet, and her friend decided David could use some fresh air and they went for a walk along the promenade at St. Clair Beach. It was cold but a full moon gave them a good light. David had in the previous week told the young woman he had had a premonition, something horrible was going to happen to the family. She told David's second trial. I asked David whether this was the something horrible that he'd seen, on the, he'd spoken about on the Tuesday. David said yes, and then dropped to his knees. He was holding his stomach, he was really upset, sort of dry sobbing. Um, and he was, he was furious with me because she, had, because she hadn't heard the question. She thought I'd asked him, you know, what was it like to find the bodies. Um, and he was down on the down on his on his knees, you know, for a good few minutes. And um, eventually, we managed to get him to stand up and um, sort of walked on a bit further. And we'd come to the bottom of John Wilson Drive. It's a cul-de-sac that sort of curves around and goes up. And he asked, he said, you know, do you mind waiting here for me? I just want to be alone for a few minutes. And he walked up and um, we waited for him. And thinking, you know, not really knowing what to do for the best. And um, he had a good old yell. He shouted and screamed and it was about 15, 20 minutes before he came back down again. We had... Um, calls for another conversation a little bit later on um, he asked me if I thought he should 
tell Greg Dunn, who was his liaison officer, um, about the premonitions and the deja vu. And at that point, I mean, it, it kind of threw me, really, because um, um, I didn't really know what to say. Um, my impression was that he'd... He couldn't rem the reason he was asking me because it was about 20 minutes or so that he couldn't remember. Did you ask him anything about whether his father had done it? Oh, yeah, on the way um, while we were walking, um, I did ask, was it your dad? And he said that um, if, it was, if, it was, if, it, if it was going to be his dad, he was going to be really, really angry with him. And he clenched his fists, and he was really emphatic. And, um, yeah. Did he say anything about himself? Oh, yeah. He, 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 said, he then said, he said, I don't know what I can say to the police to make them believe I didn't do it. It was clearly a strange week for everyone. From what witnesses say, David appeared to be struggling within himself about whether he could have killed the family. He had made elaborate plans for the funerals, and was happy to meet with friends. Some of his behaviour was very odd, even taking account of the circumstances, and more was to come. By the Thursday after the shootings, police thought they had enough evidence to arrest David, and the news filtered down to corrections officer Graham Stanley, whose son Shane was David's friend at high school. David was fond of the Stanley family and called Graham and his wife Lynn, mum and dad. Stanley was tipped off by a police officer that David would be arrested shortly. He told me in an interview last year how David appeared to him after the shootings. And I thought about it for a while and thought, my son's going to be really upset about this because at this point in time he still doesn't know and he hasn't seen David. We went up to the Clark household that night and we walked into a room similar to this one. And David walked straight up and he walked into my face and I couldn't actually see him. He was above me with his eyes. And I, this is stupid. He wasn't hugging me, he was standing there talking. So I backed off him and he walked straight in on me again. So I did the unusual thing of stepping backwards but stepping up onto the couch and standing on it. And he just turned around and he went straight over to my son. And he stood in front of him. So my son sat on the chair there. David then went and sat on that chair there and he focused his eyes on that wall down there. And not once while he spoke to us, and we were in that house for well more than half an hour with him, did he look at either of us. He just kept talking to the wall and saying, nothing really. So <clears throat> I decided that we'd been there long enough, I think it was, said we had to go. So he gives a bit of a hug each as we got to the front door. And I said to him I'd see him at the funeral. And he said, oh, you're going to the funeral? I said, yes. You're all going? I said, yes, we are. Oh, that's good. I said, well, what would you expect, David? We, you know, we're there to support you. He says, oh, I won't be there. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean you won't be there? Oh, you know. I said, what do you mean? He says, you know. Said, oh, well, we'll see you. And I left it at that. And we got home and my son went straight into his room and shut the door behind himself. And he let out a bit of an oath. <laughs> and my wife went in to see how he was. And he was sitting in his room crying. And he said to his mother, he did that, Mum. The bastard's killed his family. And the discussion that we'd had and the way he treated us was enough for Shane to realise what his mate had done. On Friday, four days after the shootings, David was driven to the police station by his Uncle Bob. David, he says, was relaxed and told him he would be glad when all this is sorted out and I can live my life. Three officers were waiting for them when they got out of the lift at the CIB building. Detective Senior Sergeant Jim Doyle took Bob away for a cup of coffee and Detective Sergeant Callum Crowdis and Detective Neil Loudon 
took David into a room for an interview. They told him he was entitled to consult and instruct a lawyer and confronted him with the information his bloody fingerprints had been found on the rifle and asked whether the missing 20 minutes explained the shootings. David gave the two police officers the following answers as relived in this actor's voice. It's a question of what happened to me. After I saw my father, I remember seeing my family being pulled away by black hands. I don't know. There was a question that Greg Dunn raised when he came around on Tuesday night. There was a question of time, about 20 minutes from the time I got home from the run to the time I rang the ambulance. I told Greg I had had a shock on Tuesday when I found out how some of the bodies were found and Bob had told me how many shots were fired. I told Greg it was like a dream. I told Greg that I had had a blackout recently at a concert. After more questions, David asked for a solicitor. Lawyer Michael Guest arrived soon afterwards and Guest told David not to answer any more questions. David was then formally charged with the murder of his family by Detective Sergeant Callum Crowdis at 1.46pm. He was asked if he had anything to say. It was an opportunity to scream out his innocence and outrage at being arrested. No, I'm not guilty, he said. On Guest's advice, he would not allow himself to again be medically examined. After a court appearance, he was remanded in custody and did not attend the funeral for his family the next day at the First Church, only a short walk from the prison. On David's first day in Dunedin Prison, Graham Stanley was in the watchtower. I became somewhat emotional, and I got sent home. I was just having difficulty with the whole situation. I knew the boy. Um... And I guess reality was starting to set in. I knew in my own mind what he'd done. I went home that day. I went back to work the next day. And I actually spoke with David that second day I went in. And I gave him a little caution to keep his mouth shut and say nothing that anything he did say that prison staff heard, they would pass on to the police. He just relaxed into the place. It was like he lived there. He did a few stupid things. He kept having fits. Every time he had one, if the nurse was there, the nurse would be called, or if he wasn't, they'd phone for the doctor. And I said to the bosses that I'd known David for a long time, and I'd never known David to have fits, and that indeed they should notify me when he had one if I was on duty and get me to go down to see him and they could come with me. And that did happen. I threw the door open, I walked straight in and David's on the floor having his fit. And I said, David, what the hell do you think you're doing? And he stopped. Midstream, stopped dead. Oh, I didn't know you were on duty today, Graham. I said, don't have fits, David. Cut it out. And I said, that's the end, no more. And there wasn't. That was the end of his fits. Didn't need a doctor, didn't need a nurse or anything else. Just needed to be told in front of staff he didn't have fit. If Stanley is right, then David was faking a fit. When we remember that the ambulance staff who checked David in the house after the shootings also thought he was faking, the prison incident takes on the greater significance. Let's look at what he told his family. On Tuesday the following week, David's uncles went to visit him in Dunedin Prison. They wanted to talk to him about what to do with the house at Every Street. Michael Bain recalled the visit in the second trial. Last evening we were um, at the point in your evidence where you were, and your uh, brother-in-law and others have been to visit David Bain in the leading prison on Tuesday the 28th of June. And I think you told us you discussed family matters, the, um, what to do with the house. And I just want to ask you about, did you ask him anything before you left? Yes, I, I, because no other member of the family had posed the critical question, I took it upon myself to do that, and I used the words, did you do it? Meaning, did you commit the offence that's been alleged against you? And what was his reply, if um, He didn't um, say, yes, he did it. He did not say, he didn't hear the words that he used from memory were, uh, I've told my 
side of it to the police and I'll stick to that. That's what I remember vaguely that he said, or words to that effect. If David's story stacks up, that leaves Robin as the killer. But why would this kind, gentle, religious man shoot his family? We'll take a look at the stresses that might have pushed a father over the edge in the next episode. I'm Martin Van Banen. Thank you for listening. This podcast is a joint stuff and tandem studios production. Written and presented by Martin Van Banen, audio engineered and co-produced by Brett Robertson and produced by Dave Dunlay and Kamala Heyman.